This is Tibet, the roof of the world, a country steeped in tradition and a people deeply influenced by Buddhism. A strong sense of compassion has formed the basis of their non-violent struggle for freedom. A freedom struggle that began when the People's Republic of China carried out their peaceful liberation of Tibet. For the Tibetans, it has been anything but. Today, what the world knows as Tibet is, in fact, the Tibet Autonomous Region, an area only half the size of what was Tibet before the Chinese occupation. After the occupation, the borders of Tibet were redrawn and the provinces of Amdo and Kham were deleted from the map. They are now known as the Chinese provinces of Qinghai and Shizhuang. This story of Tibet begins with a boy, born into a peasant family in northeastern Tibet in 1935. Only two years old, he was recognized as the reincarnation of his predecessor, the 13th Dalai Lama. As the spiritual and political leader of the Tibetan people, the institution of the Dalai Lama is entrenched deep in Tibet's history. The current Dalai Lama is regarded as the embodiment of the Buddha of compassion, an enlightened being who has chosen to take rebirth in order to serve humanity. As a teenager, he faced his biggest challenge as leader of Tibet, the Chinese occupation. Uh, Tibet, under the Dalai Lama, uh, Dalai Lama's government. Uh, no Chinese influence, no Chinese control, no Chinese office in Hassan. When I was there. Ngamatchi Around 8-9,000 Tibetan army already crashed. Then, Chairman Mo preferred Chinese Liberation Army. Stop at Chengdu. Chinese government prefer Tibet peaceful liberation. So 1951, 17 point agreement signed. The 17 point agreement with PRC leadership was exactly what we are talking about now as a middle path. The PRC agreed to uh, respect the Tibetan civilization, Tibetan way of life. They will not uh, encroach into the internal matters of the uh, local Tibet government headed by His Holiness. Only the external affairs and defense would be taken care of by the central government. The traditional powers of His Holiness, the Dalai Lama and the Panchen Lama will not be disturbed in any way. The religious freedom and the cultural freedom will be respected. Then, 1954, I went to China as a one member of Tibetan delegation for Chinese People's Congress. When I coming to Peking, this road, I have full suspicion, doubt, 
fear. During that period, I had several meetings with Chairman Mo. Uh, Chairman Mo, oh, wonderful revolutionary person. At that time, I developed genuine respect and admiration, admire for him. And I also, you see, learned useful advice from Chairman I so much attracted towards Marxism. 55, I returned on the road, 18th Army General, his name, Tang Koha. On the road, we met. Then I told him, after 10 months, now I'm coming back with full confidence. And because since then, I become Marxist. Still, I describe in many places in America, in Europe, in Latin America, I describe myself as a half Marxist, a half Buddhist. I think as far as ideology is concerned, I am more communist rather than these Chinese present leaders. <laughs> Their main concern is economy and power. Uh, of course, their rigid system is concerned. I totally against. As soon as the PRC able to uh, make their roads to central Tibet and then military force and equipment was uh, able to uh, transport to Tibet, they begin to violate each point of the 17-point agreement willfully and knowingly. Beginning of 56, a price. Chinese response, militarily suppressed. Then 56, I came to India. I had a long talk with Pandit Nehru. And also one occasion, Chu and I also joined. Then Chairman Mao promised through Prime Minister Chu and I, Chinese central government do not consider Tibet as ordinary Chinese provinces. Tibet case, special case. At that time, I discussed with Pan Nehru uh, seriously, including whether I should return or not. I'm thinking to remain in India. But Nehru advised me, you should return to Tibet. Then, out of seven in point, on this point, you should fight. I return February 1957. Finally, 1959, Tibetan people completely frustrated. So then, next one week, I try my best to cool down the situation. But Chinese, every night from 10th of March till 17th, Chinese troop movement. So it's clear Chinese side determined to strike. 17th night, I left Hassan. The 17 point agreement was denounced for the first uh, uh, press conference taken by His Holiness. Number one, the 17 point agreement was uh, concluded under duress. And secondly, PRC have uh, uh, violated it systematically. So we are not anymore bound under the 17 point agreement. We demand for restoration of Tibetan independence. In late 60s, His Holiness was uh, thinking and discussing with his uh, advisors that uh, our demand for restoration of independence may not be re realistic because not any world power or any other nation are helping us and they recognize the Tibetan independence and China is now a rising power. Therefore, we must think about uh, not demanding for separation but demanding for genuine autonomy and discussion was going on for several years. In 74, we made up in our mind. In future, whenever we have opportunity to talk with Chinese government, then not seeking independence, but to achieve meaningful autonomy. 1979, in response to uh, Deng Xiaoping's offer, the middle path policy was started. So since then, the direct contact with the Chinese government started. In early 80s, there was real hope. Deng Xiaoping there, he publicly admit past mistake. The communist leader publicly admit their mistake is very, very rare. The communist policy or totalitarian policy always right. <laughs> the first political uprising that uh, 
was known worldwide after 1959 is the September 27, 1987 protest, which was led by 21 monks from Drebung Monastery. Their basic demand was that they should be human rights in Tibet and that the Chinese authorities pay attention to the five points uh, proposed uh, proposal made by His Holiness the Dalai Lama in the U.S. Congress. Freedom movement or democracy movement from many universities started, I think, 86 or 87. In 1988, March 5th, and we were doing protests for free Tibet. Then everywhere security, and then there were protests, and the Chinese started shooting the weapon. And then I saw two Tibetan young girl, and they shoot in her heart. One Tibetan man shoot his head, they're dead. There's some Tibetan young monks, 11 years or 10 years of monks, in the very high building in the Chagan Temple. They push, dance, they also saw those monks broken, and the arm broken, everywhere blood, and the, this Chagan Temple areas, our holy place. Then finally, 89, Tangerman massacred happened. So, whole policy become more hardline, hard. But then, beginning of 2000, through some Chinese businessmen or some individual Chinese, we renewed direct control with the Chinese government. So, up to now, five uh, meetings, round table talk with Chinese officials uh, took place. But then, unfortunately, as a result of replacement of party secretary, now policy inside the Fed hardened. Suppression much increased. Restrictions much increased. The Chinese did not come to Tibet by mistake. And in my view, they will never willingly and voluntarily walk away from Tibet. They want more land, they want more mineral resources, they want more water. And for that they found Tibet very useful. Chinese are in Tibet to stay and that they are destroying not just Tibetan life and culture, which will affect only six million Tibetans, but they are destroying the fragile environment of Tibet to an extent where it will have global implications. The biggest rivers in Asia, it comes from the Tibetan plateau. So once this plateau is being spoiled, it's being degraded, then it'll have so much impact on the rest of the Asia. The next great war may be fought not over oil, but fresh water. And to that extent, Tibet is a geopolitical global issue, not just an issue about six million Tibetans. Tibet is the source of uh, rivers for most of Asia, including China, Bangladesh, Burma, Laos, Cambodia, Pakistan, India, Nepal, Bhutan. This is about half the world's population. If you see the Tibetan issue from this global perspective, Tibet issue also is there, very much related with environment issue. So environment issue, the whole world should take serious concern. Now with this Three Gorges Dam, I hope I'm wrong, but it is said that the Three Gorges Dam will result in creating the biggest artificial inland sea. And this huge body of water in combination with the dozens of other dams they have in that region, my fear is it may be big enough to alter the temperature of the Tibetan plateau and the consequences of that are too terrible to contemplate. And to this there is a scientific basis. The, the craze for oil today will be the craze for fresh water, fresh drinking water tomorrow. Tibet is not just about Tibetans, that it is about the roof of the world, that because of China's invasion and occupation of Tibet, for the first time now in history, we have India and China sharing a common frontier, which is more than one third of humanity locked in this unwinnable arms race. This cannot be in anybody's interest, especially in the interest of people who talk about world peace. 
we only talked about the rights of six million t Tibetans and they think, oh, it's all very sad, but it's all over. Six million Jews were killed in the last great war. You know, they think it was some little valleys lost in the Himalayas. Tibet is 2.5 million square kilometers. You know, if Tibet were free, India and China would be a thousand kilometers apart. What would that mean for world peace? Everybody, whole world, you should take serious concern about world peace, peace of Asia. Now, in that case, it's China, India's good relation uh, on the basis of mutual trust is a very, very important matter. For that respect, you see, Tibet issue is directly involved. China is uh, migrating uh, Chinese into Tibet in such a large scale where even if they want to now finally implement their um, national minority uh, constitution may not be relevant with the Tibetans anymore because Tibetans would be minorities in every area of Tibet. Since the first Tibetan freedom fighters demanded a Tibet free of Chinese communist rule, many Tibetans have continued in their footsteps. In this country under the rule of law, there is no freedom of speech. Many Tibetans who speak out have been and continue to be imprisoned, tortured and even killed. we tried to demonstrate it on the, during the Chinese New Year, and at that time, a lot of soldiers and Chinese policemen around the area in Tibet, in the central area, and some police uh, wear the uniform, but some police didn't wear the uniform. And we started demonstration with maybe, I think, five, six, and five and six minutes. And after that, a lot of police came to the, us and they uh, take us. ジェジェラ、ジェジェラ、カサクザ。タクザニアニ、ニンダリスタキセチグレ、フランスタンデスカリチンゼカリンバスタ、フランスタメゲジェチタニチヤスケオマラバ。タゾニダナナンデ、
The work is very difficult and then food is also not enough. Chemist, <laughs> え、だそうそうロゼでだ、メドメナナ、そうそうだ、何でメドメスタンデス、シュドジャグロワ。で、ジャグロで。だ、で、ジャワ、トムズベツエブ。トムズベツエブ、トムズベタンガンズピチャン
with birth and death, joy and tears, at any home, anywhere. A place to share, a place of love, the only age button. It is only the Tibetans in exile who are free to speak. On the 10th of March 2007, Tibetans in Dharamsala, India, prepare for the National Uprising Day celebration. A day when Tibetans remember the freedom struggle and those who gave their lives in the first Tibetan uprising in 1959. Every March 10, we remember the national uprising that happened in 1959. The 10th of March is our Tibetan National Uprising Day. And every year, this is the day when all the Tibetans, uh, they come out into the street and protest. By 1959, the whole of Tibet was under occupation. And uh, so that's when uh, the Tibetan women, for the first time in the history of Tibet, uh, decided to raise their voice for their people and for the country. So we continued the struggle for the cause of Tibet that was initiated by women then uh, who sacrificed their lives. A number of them died during that one week uh, demonstration. Many of them have been in prison and spent as long as 20 years in prison. Gandhi, he created this mass movement These were examples for us, you know. The struggle for the Tibetan people, it is based on non-violence. If it needs to succeed, people of the world needs to help it. It's a time to look back and reflect what we have done and where to go in the freedom struggle. In recent time, people have become complacent and people have become confused in exile because the Tibetan government in exile, they have requested the people not to protest. This time, we're going to do it in a major big way because we feel that even though the Tibetan government has, you know, their approach towards middle, middle way policy has been sincere, but the Chinese government has not responded in an equal term. The Dalai Lama instigated the middle way policy in an attempt to peacefully resolve the issue of Tibet. This policy calls for autonomy for Tibet within the People's Republic of China. But failure by the Chinese government to come to the negotiating table has meant the middle way policy has not produced results and now some Tibetans say it's time for things to change. Our approach not seeking independence, but seeking genuine autonomy. So that's a mutual benefit. To us, the genuine autonomy is the best guarantee for preservation of Tibetan culture, Tibetan spirituality, and also Tibetan language, and also <coughs> as a guarantee for protection of Tibetan environment. His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been very optimistic for a negotiated solution. In, so he has been taking the initiative in the dialogue process. Now the situation has changed. It is, the situation is no longer about the Dalai Lama's initiative. China has clearly shown and expressed in a most uh, succinct way that they are not interested in talking Tibet and for them Tibet is a closed chapter. We try our best, you see, to appeal Chinese government uh, to look Tibet uh, issue realistically. And firstly, uh, they should know the reality. Uh, the Chinese government, you see, 
uh, do not admit there is problem. <laughs> It's a question of the duty of His Holiness to recognize that the Chinese are in Tibet not by mistake, that their uh, plan and strategy is to eliminate the Tibetans as a nation and then act accordingly. And unless His Holiness recognizes that uh, the middle way policy cannot, will not work and restores freedom as the goal and leads the Tibetan people into meaningful action, I am sorry, I hope I'm wrong, we are finished.我觉得达赖喇嘛的中庸之道是一个很高的智慧the Tibetan Women's Association is the only NGO that supports Middle Path. In 1996, at the fifth general body meeting of uh, Tibetan Women's Association, unanimously passed a resolution that whatever you know, path that is shown by His Holiness. Looking at the changing reality, political reality of uh, Tibet, that path will be uh, followed by Tibetan Women's Association. And they materially Tibet very, very backward. The spiritually, we really advanced. I think we are quite rich. But spiritual alone cannot fulfill our stomach. So we need money, <laughs> we need sort of economic development. For that reason, China, huge country, great potential of progress. Therefore, remain within people's of China is our own interest. On one side, we respect his reforms. On the other side, when his holiness continues to insist on the idea of uh, looking for a genuine autonomy uh, through the process of middle way path. We don't agree. But we have a democratic uh, society. And here we can make individual choice. And, and when it comes to political decision, we say, Your Holiness, we respect you, but we want to make our, our own political decision. And, and, and for that decision, we will take the responsibility and we'll get into action. And that's how I think the youth are making a difference in the struggle, in creating a new Tibet. My position is something like semi-retired position. I'm acting like advisor or senior advisor. <laughs> but in practical as well as theoretical, the real decision in his hand, the elected, politi elected political leadership's hand, and not my, my hand. We all should join together to prayer for change of mind and hearts of the present leadership and present rulers. That is the only way to uh, get an emancipation for all the suffering people. Today with this middle way policy, the, the, the goal is no longer clear. Just as there can be no journey without a destination, there can be no struggle without a goal. So getting an act together is first of all restoring what I call clarity of purpose. Restoring freedom as the one and only goal of the Tibetan struggle. And we are not against the ordinary Chinese people. They have also suffered a great deal under this military colonial regime. Up to now, we have been waiting for the delegation uh, to go and come back with some news and therefore find a solution to Tibet. So the people will have to make a decision, have to take initiative on their own and get into action. So how it comes is up to the people. Many young Tibetans, including youth organizations, they are very critical, very critical about our approach. 
we fully committed about democracy. So any criticism, most welcome. However, so if they made some kind of realistic, practical proposal, then majority of Tibetan people will support that. Even on the question of the practical solution for a free and independent Tibet, I believe it is possible. I don't see this as a rift. Media wants uh, a point of tension to show a conflict. And this is interesting for them to make a story and get people excited. Well, see, there is a problem from in, within the community. But I don't think um, that there is a problem there. There is a, v a variety of uh, opinions which is the color of democracy, which is the beauty of it, that you have such a variety and uh, we will find a consensus and, and which, whichever uh, gets uh, the highest vote is taken as a, as, as a decision for, for the whole struggle. I was the first Tibetan to openly criticize what is now known as the middle way policy and I stand by that position. We always welcome these different opinions, including criticism towards me. Okay, very good. We are not like Chinese, Chinese leaders. <laughs> because it's a situation inside Tibet, the instead of improving, but worsening. Too much suppress, torture, very serious torture. Now I feel the vast majority of the Tibetans are they are frustrated about this and they want to come out and uh, take uh, the matters into their head. In March 2008, something changed. Inside Tibet, the people could no longer hide their frustration. All over the country, Tibetans in their thousands came out in defiance of Chinese communist rule. As the world watched, the tanks rolled in and soldiers stormed the streets of Lhasa. Now that we see that all over Tibet, from Lhasa to Shikatse and central Tibet, and then uh, the whole of Kham and Amdo, everywhere during the protests, we say that people have only one voice, one call. So I think it has to come back to independence as a goal of the struggle. Finally, people around the world were taking notice. in Tibet spread around the world, China's global Olympic torch route met with protests worldwide. The journey of harmony quickly descended into a farce as the Olympic torch no longer represented the light of knowledge, life and spirit or the unity that the Olympic Games were designed to create.
People all over the world took to the streets in huge numbers in defense of human rights and freedom for Tibet. China will try to cover up uh, their invasion, control and destruction of uh, many other countries like Tibet, East Turkestan, Mongolia, Manchuria. China will, in its biggest show of power and money, uh, China will showcase uh, the cultures from all these occupied countries and show that we are most powerful, advanced, civilized and, uh, and democratic and that there is such a unity. They try to show this. They will parade Tibet and people from all these occupied countries in front of the world and say, see, they are all happy. And I think this is the statement that we have to fight. We have to counter, and we will not allow China to do this. Beijing will try its best to portray a very glamorous and a very happy citizen in in China. Look beyond the glamour and the propaganda that the Chinese government will put for sure. Be educated about Tibet in order to uh, realize uh, human rights in the whole of Tibet. Jemus 所以中国的老百姓应该用最大的能力去反对和抵制这场奥运会。这个奥运会绝对不是中国人民的荣耀，它是给共产党脸上贴金，使得共产党有更多的机会来镇压和剥削中国的老百姓。of course, Chinese people they like Olympic, but Chinese this communist government they make it suffer their own people, they torture, execute. Every day news coming in the special and farmer people, Chinese, Chinese farmer people, very, very poor. They have no money, they have very difficult life. Sometimes they have no medical treatment. Sick people, a lot of people dead in China. Not only they suffer the Tibet, they also make their own people suffer. They know Olympic Committee or they know everything, but they only look in money, China. That's very wrong. The Nedunibadi, China has now, unlike before, has uh, now learned to be sophisticated, I must say. They have learned the tricks, deal with the pressures coming from um, different countries. The nations of the world seem to be afraid of China. This is a shame, I would feel. The frustration is about these international politics, where the issue is always about money. Perhaps the market is the, the only value for humanity in this world. This is uh, the attitude of the uh, developed countries. Here, when we talk about a better environment, uh, 
a sense of justice, freedom, and democracy. It doesn't uh, give them anything in return in terms of physical money, and they don't want to invest their energy in this. Is the purpose of human life only to accumulate wealth? You know, there are nations who are really rich and sufficient and still want to be, you know, that consumerism culture is making them bent down to China because of their population. There was a, a very honest uh, statement by a very important person. He was saying that Tibet issue, human rights, religious freedom are very, very important for us. But we cannot lose the Chinese market on account of this. So it's hugely frustrating to see these big nations talking about peace and harmony, but at the end of the day, they trade all these social values for money. So many Chinese uh, intellectuals and also some businessmen, including some of the Chinese high officials, also, you see, they, they pri privately, personally, you see, they see you see, the present policy is counterproductive. If they continue to respect the people's rights, then they will definitely get a more and more strong opposition. Now, this has given us an opportunity uh, for the Tibetans, you know, because for so many years we have been uh, telling the world that, you know, our, our human rights are being violated, our lands are being captured. But now this is the time where China would have the litmus test for them, whether their society is an open society, whether they respect fundamental human rights. We will take every opportunity, you know, to expose them. You see, we are not asking the Chinese government to be more compassionate. No, <laughs> we simply, you see, telling them present their policy is unrealistic. And that brings more disaster in the future. even without Tibetan, the, the Tibetan movement will keep on moving. Our struggle through non-violent way, now this kind of struggle should succeed. Because now, when I look at this, when I get involved in this, it's no longer about the Tibetan nation. It's about the new world that we want to create. A new world of justice. A new world of clean environment. Freedom, democracy, human right, and also non-violence. If these are necessary, then people should support the Tibet cause. If people of different nations are able to think that we are all equal human beings and you enjoy all the human rights living in your country and if you have this feeling for other fellow human beings that they have also the right to enjoy all these human rights, then you must support for the Tibetan cause. While I am prepared to die in the struggle for freedom, I am not prepared to waste a single day of my life to help make Tibet a part of China.